Think Forward. Think Research Channel. This series of uh, lectures is really trying to bring some of the questions that may be um, of interest and of obviously of importance to many of our patients in the, the area. And, and the second talk, as you know, the first one was on atrial fibrillation. The second one is on uh, drug eluding stents, which I'm sure many of you may have had um, stents put in yourself or maybe con considering it or maybe hearing about it that uh, we thought is important to talk about uh, because there's a lot of um, lay uh, sort of information about the safety of these stents, and some of them are true and some of them are not uh, uh, accurate. So after my talk for about maybe 30 minutes or so, and uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Bill Fearon, will talk about why do you need to have uh, um, a procedure such as angioplasty? What is it? When is it indicated uh, for? Also, there's a fair amount of controversy recently about uh, whether an angioplasty procedure is safe uh, compared to taking medications, for example. Uh, and then finally, uh, I have one of my patients here um, who have had a couple of these procedures, and we can ask him some of his uh, concerns and also what his thought process was in deciding uh, whether he should have uh, this type of procedure. So my talk first is really uh, to go through with you um, about uh, drug eluding stent, the question is, are they safe? And I always have to put in a conflict of interest statement nowadays since I'm on um, a lot of the advisory board for the companies who make stents, and these are actually all the companies that make stents for the United States, so I'm kind of equally conflicted among them. So essentially, I hope to give you a very balanced view of why we think uh, this is a good technology, why is it not, and what can be improved uh, on it for the future. Just to review with you uh, what is uh, heart disease and why are we concerned and why does it need to be treated, is that if you look at a normal artery, which are these are arteries that supply blood flow to your heart muscle, and if it is normal, you have a very thin walled artery, just like a pipe in your house, and will carry the blood flow in a very normal uh, fashion. But as you build up plaque, which is dictated by risk factors such as diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, and high cholesterol through many years that you can see the plaque will gradually build up in the wall of the artery. But the heart is pretty smart. In the beginning, the artery actually enlarges and accommodates this plaque without the lumen or the hole of the artery getting compromised. It's only when you have a tremendous amount of uh, disease buildup, then the lumen starts to get smaller and eventually very small. So you can understand by that point, there will be decrease in blood flow to the heart muscle because there's not adequate hole or lumen in the artery to carry the blood flow, especially during exercise. Because during exercise, your blood flow has to be increased up to three to five times normal uh, compared to when you're at rest. And therefore, at that point, there will be more uh, issue of blood flow. If you cut across these arteries in a pathological study, a lot of patients ask me, what are these material? What is inside uh, these uh, uh, arteries? Are they hamburgers? Or are they like, you know, ham? Or what exactly is in there? And what is it made out of is obviously part of what we are uh, eating and part of what our genetic makeup uh, is, is, meaning there are a lot of cholesterol, a lot of different kind of lipids, which is fat, and a various um, amount of calcification, calcium buildup. And this has nothing to do with your bone. It is really a process of how the artery tries to heal itself, is to harden the artery. And so, you know, many of you may have CT scan and look at calcium score. It is a way of measuring how much activity is in the artery been trying to sort of repair itself. You can have clot, which is thrombus, and you also have tissue, such as what we call smooth muscle cells, it's like a scar tissue that grows within this artery, and finally some scar as well. So you can see, cutting across, and using that cartoon pictures, you can see now there's a lot of um, 
uh, tissue in the arteries. And finally, the artery can be completely closed and looking at the, the bottom with only very few little holes uh, providing blood flow. This is what it appears to be like when on an angiogram. You, this is when we take a picture in the, what we call the um, cardiac catheterization laboratory. We use a catheter, inject dye, and it shoot x-ray through the body. So this is an analogy I tell many of my patients. It's very similar to injecting color water through a transparent tube system. You won't see the tubes. You only see the column of the color water. So here the dye appears uh, as dark, and you can see there's a narrowing in this particular artery. The normal part is quite wide, and here it's narrowed down to a, a trickle. So this is the, um, what we will see on angiogram because the, uh, the, the art, heart artery is narrowed. So that is uh, building of a plaque, and that's one process of how heart arteries can get diseased. Now the other one is uh, a little different, same process, same process but manifests, manifests, manifests itself in a different way, and this is heart attacks. So the first one, when the artery gradually narrows, you get symptoms like an angina. When you go exercise, you get chest pressure in, 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 the, in the upper thoracic area, and then when you stop, it will go away. Very predictable, usually. The second one is a little less predictable. It's more like an earthquake of the, of the heart arteries, is that the heart arteries that could actually have clots form on top of it because the surface of these plaques gets very unstable because it's trying to repair itself, and it cracks, for example, on the surface. And when it cracks, the blood is exposed to the material that I just showed you, the fat, the scar tissue, and those materials are very clot-prone, uh, meaning that they will generate clots because it makes sense, the body is trying to think it is a wound, so it tried to clot to stop any uh, material from uh, coming out, if you may. So if too much clot forms, the artery is completely blocked suddenly, and this is when you have a heart attack, or oh, the medical term is myocardial infarction. You'll hear a fair amount of that term, uh, MI or myocardial infarction during uh, our talks. So obviously, if you cut off the blood supply completely, then you would have a heart attack. So this is a patient that, uh, with the angiogram showing there's a missing artery in the, this portion of the uh, angiogram. There's an artery, as I'll show you, and we will take them to the cardiac catheterization laboratory quickly and restore blood flow and create, bring the artery back. And once you can restore blood flow to the artery, the muscle then will basically get nutrients, get oxygen again, and the heart attack is aborted, if you may. So those are the two major manifestations of heart disease. As one is angina due to, due to gradual narrowing of the heart arteries, and the other one is a sudden closing of the heart arteries due to clots um, and due to a sort of unpredictable and somewhat uh, uh, a nature that is due to plaque formation, but the chances are relatively small. The problem with heart attacks is that it affects your heart function. The heart is a piece of muscle, and it needs oxygen. If you scarred it too often or too many areas, it will start to pump uh, adequately. So on the left here is when the heart fills, and on the right here is when the heart squeezes down. You can see the heart gets smaller because it pumps a lot of that blood out to your main artery to supply nutrients to the rest of your body. But if you have a heart attack, then some of the muscle won't work. So on the left, again, is still the heart filling, but when you look at the right, now the heart doesn't come become as small because part of the muscle is lost in function. It could not come down anymore. So you can imagine the difference between the two sides in, in volume is how much blood you pump. And if you, if you cannot squeeze down too much, you're not pumping much blood each beat. And that would subsequently lead to what we call heart failure, that you would not be able to do too much work if you're tired, and you may accumulate fluid, and you might uh, end up getting a lot of uh, edema as well. So I'm not going to talk about too much uh, about this. The therapy for this type of problems, the angina, the heart attacks, is obviously is cornerstone is still medical therapy, which includes medicine, chest, chest beta blockers. I'm sure many of you heard about nitroglycerins uh, and others to really balance, trying to make heart, the heart a little bit more efficient. It has nothing to do with really increasing blood supply. It's really trying to um, increase the efficiency of the heart, if you may. There are also me important medications such as the statin. You know, people take Lipitor, Zocor, Vitorin, and so forth. It's to lower the cholesterol, to lower the cholesterol to a point, for example, bringing the bad cholesterol to less than 70 to stop the plaque from growing further, if not regressing it over a period of time. So those are all very important, obviously, stopping bad habits. And this is the cornerstone of treating this disease process. But unfortunately, this therapy doesn't really get rid of the narrowing that causes angina uh, efficiently. 
So in the past, people talked about having, obviously, uh, many of you know, bypass surgery essentially is taking pieces of vein or using your own artery. On the left here is the vein bypassing, a piece of vein from your leg, and then reroutes the blood flow from the aorta to your uh, heart arteries. Now using a couple of existing kind of spared a uh, artery in your chest, these are internal memory arteries, or we could short term call IMA, and bypass the artery using those. The advantage is obviously the artery lasts longer because the veins were not built to uh, carry the blood flow that uh, an artery is supposed to. Obviously surgery takes time, takes about three to four hours of, of uh, what we call stopping the chest on pump on the hot lung machine um, because it would take away the blood flow from the heart so that the surgeon can work on a heart that is not beating. And then it takes about seven to five days, five to seven days in the hospital for recovery, and then a couple of months of uh, 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 gradually return to full activities. So it's a pretty involved and, and big surgery. And again, as I told you, the arterial grafts are good because they are supposed to carry high pressure blood flow, and they last for decades if, um, if the surgery works in the first place. But the vein are not designed to do so. They really have an attrition rate about 50% at 10 years. And obviously, um, that may be even higher or lower, depends on the individual person. You can have a second or third bypass, but each time the risk of the procedure probably go up a bit more because you have to open up the same scarred area and, um, and also uh, as you get older as well. So the other method of treating these blockages are using uh, angioplasty. These are using little balloons um, the original sort of first few angioplasty was done here and, uh, by Dr. Simpson, um, John Simpson, and also Dr. Sturzer, who is here, but he did his first angioplasty in New York. And these are little balloons that we go in and thread through the catheter, and I'll show you later on how this is done that uh, will open up the heart arteries. And there's a variety of little tools. We kind of call ourselves as, as plumbers because just like a plumber, we have different tools to go in and try to open up those blockages, including up here is... Uh, um, catheter that doesn't shave some of these plaque off from inside the artery. So this is called atherectomy. And these are um, tools that we can use to look inside the heart arteries called ultrasound. We can take little pictures of the heart artery and measure how narrow these are in a cross-sectional fashion. So you can see these are little pictures that we obtain by looking inside the artery. And finally, we have now stents, which are little metal tubes or metal coils that allow us to put it on a balloon and when you stretch it open and then take the balloon down and take it out of the body, we leave this little metal mesh holding up the artery inside and therefore opening up a big lumen for blood flow to uh, occur. And so this is really the uh, invention probably in the mid 1990s that allow us to make the procedure also safer because with balloons, the balloon sometimes tears the artery and then the tearing will actually collapse the artery back. So this is helpful to open up the artery, prevent collapsing the artery, and also prevent some of the scar tissue from forming. But unfortunately, with the stents, scar tissue still forms. What I mean by that is that when you, after a procedure like an angioplasty to open up the artery, the scar, the body thinks it is an injury, just like you see if you got cut on your skin. So it tries to heal that cut. And this is an internal cut, if you may. So the scar tissue grow inward. And this is a slide showing a cross-section of such a stent in a person. And showing here that this is the metal part is the stent. And, but you now can see, rather than there's a big lumen, a big hole should be this size, scar tissue has grown through the stent and re-narrows the artery again. So this is a term we call re-stenosis, meaning that the artery re-narrowed again. And this is, can happen a fair amount of the time using what we call a bare metal stent, meaning a, metal just, a stent just made of plain stainless steel. And the scar tissue generally is about one millimeter in thickness. You say, well, one millimeter, that's pretty small. Why is it a problem? Because if you have a one millimeter scar on your skin, everybody will be pretty happy that you know, there's a pretty minimal scar. But remember, the artery itself is only about three millimeter in diameter. So if you have an artery a little smaller, 2.5 millimeters, growing a one millimeter scar or 1.2 millimeter scar narrows the heart artery automatically by 50% already. So if your stent was not completely two and a half millimeters quickly, you lose what you have gained by this scar tissue growing in. So the question is that you know, for the last decade or so, people have been working on mechanisms to try to get this scar to go away or decrease the scar. And it's been actually quite difficult using different mechanical ways 
different types of systemic drugs, nothing seems to work. Everything seems to give you still the amount of scar tissue, about 1 on 1.2 1 or 5 millimeters. And giving you a chance of re-narrowing probably in the upward of about 20%, meaning that after a stenting procedure, you may still have to come back between 10 to 20% of the time in the first nine months for a second procedure. A second procedure could be bypass surgery or a re-intervention, reopening of the artery again. But if you keep re-intervening uh, uh, re on the artery, it seems to work less and less because there's more scar, more scar type of thing. So again, the, the solution is to try and find something that will get rid of the scar tissue. And really, the way, only way to learn about this is to find out what the mechanism of this restenosis is. And the mechanism is just, I said to you, is really an injury uh, response. Just like if you get cut on the skin, you get cut anywhere, the body try to heal it. And it doesn't know where it is, right? It just it doesn't know where it's the skin, whether it's inside your, your artery. It creates a variety of inflammatory markers, a variety of uh, signals for the cells inside to respond. And one of these are going through the smooth muscle cells, essentially tissue that's supposed to be responsible for healing. And there's a variety of signals that come through that allows the body to secrete certain type of proteins and allow certain type of cells to move into the area to heal. So as I would say, the drug eluding stent, as listed here, DES, is really a mechanism, have a stent that has drug in it, impregnated in it, that will be um, eluding out and stop this inflammatory reaction or the scar tissue formation. It makes sense because if you can stop the scar tissue signal from going down, it will then stop the scar tissue formation. So again, the, a little bit more detail for interest is that the restenosis process is really these cells growing, proliferating. So the cells will double, right? It becomes two cells, four cells uh, to form this scar. So the drug eluding stents have drugs that will work and block this cell cycle. If you may, it's a little bit similar to drugs that treat cancer because cancers are cells that grow very rapidly. But the, here is we using drugs and methods to stop healing cell response, which is also cell growing, duplicating. And here, there's two sets of, uh, of drugs that are currently on our stents. This is, uh, and the first part is called cerulimus, or the Limus family drug. There's a couple of other drugs uh, in the same family is being used in the newer generation of, generation of stents. And then the bottom one here is paclitaxel. It's another drug that is available in the other currently FDA-approved stent. And both work in this cell cycle to block the cells from uh, growing. So now you can understand what is the mechanism behind restenosis. Then I think the challenge for the last decade also is how the heck do we put the little drugs on these little stents? Because these little stents, the struts of these stents are thinner than your hair. So you have to put this drug on it and allow it to stay and allow it to come out in a certain way, meaning it cannot just come out in, in two hours. It has to come out in over at least 14, if not 30 days. The reason is that the body responds to the injury not in one hour. It takes about a few days and then builds up that uh, signal over time. So there's a variety of companies in the past worked on various different ways and just maybe, in, for, for example, on the top, just putting the, some of the drugs on top of the stent. They try to say, well, maybe if we just dip the stent in the drug, maybe it will adhere to it and it will come out. Obviously, that didn't work too well because the drug came out too quickly. Then there's a variety of polymers, essentially plastic, that they impregnate the drug in and then allow the drug to slowly come out um, through a variety of ways. So the two systems that was um, approved in 2003 and 2004 by the FDA, uh, one is called the Cypher Stent, which is made by uh, Johnson & Johnson Cordis, and using the drug Cerulimus, as I showed you earlier, and it has a sort of hard plastic uh, 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 polymer that holds the drug, and in the stent, that is a typical coronary stent and this will allow the drug to come out very uh, gradually. The other one approved in 2004 is called the Texas Den, which used the drug Paclitaxel, made by a company called Boston Scientific, and again, a plastic um, derivative on the stent, and then um, put it into the heart artery. So the stent itself is really not very different. If you look at it by naked eye, you cannot tell between a drug stent and a bare metal stent because the coating is really in the range of about 10 to 16 microns. So that's really very, very thin on top of a very relatively thin strut already. So we said, well, okay, that seems to be very reasonable. That um, sounds very good. So what is the benchmark? What, how do you want to prove that this stent actually works? 
that sounds good on, on, on the table in the lab, but does it work in patients? And so obviously the process going through here is called the, with the FDA is the, you do pivotal trials. You do randomized studies, meaning that you put uh, a group of patients, treat half of them with the drug stent, and the other half with the same stent, but no drug in it. So a bare metal stent versus a, a drug stent study. So you compare them, but the patient doesn't know and the doctor, some study the doctor knows because the stent looks like packaging slightly different. But nevertheless, they will follow in a blinded fashion and see how often different events come out, whether they have more uh, heart attacks, whether they have more, uh, obviously, mortality. And also one benchmark that's most important, as I said before, is that in the stented patients, bare metal stented patients, about 20% of them may come back in nine months for more procedures, which is the, the, the Achilles heel, if you may, of, of stenting. So that would be a good benchmark because if you can reduce that substantially, that means that this is an a, a, a effective and new way of treating the heart disease. Generally, most medical studies, if you observe about a 20% reduction, that's a pretty good uh, uh, refactor already. So most drugs, so when you say was well, approved by the FDA compared to something else or compared to placebo, generally the effect is about 25%. So an event may be 10% of the time you might have, you know, uh, pain in your knee, then you take a drug, now it becomes 8%. Generally, that felt to be a good effect, and you get approval. So here, if you look at this, these two, uh, this slide, it's a little complicated, but just to take you through, this is looking at the TLR rate. This is a name that we use to describe how often patients come back for their another procedure. So target lesion revascularization, meaning they go back again because the lesion blocked up because of symptoms or stress tests, they have to re-intervene again. So, and on the left panel is the cipher stent, and the right panel is the Texas stent. Very similar results, so I kind of just take you uh, through it in, in a way that uh, uh, explain both slides. So on the top of uh, each, on the Y axis, is really telling you how many patients over a period of time, four years here, that will require a reintervention, uh, free from a reintervention. So in the yellow line on the left screen here, are patients that were treated with the cipher stent, the drug stent. And over four years, more than 90% of the patients are free from another intervention, meaning they do not need anything else. They come to see the doctor, and every time the doctor says, you're doing fine, you have no symptoms, stress test is good for four years. Compared to the, the bare metal stent, which is the blue line in the same curve, uh, only about 75% of the patients that have actually free from those 20%, 25% of patients needed another procedure, whether it's surgery, whether another angioplasty. So this is a really a very big effect. Before we talked about really a reduction of 20%. This is a reduction of an effect of 75% of the, what we thought is an important outcome. So similarly, Texas uh, has similar reduction. So this is what we call an efficacy study. So it means that this new platform, new method of treatment is helpful. It's uh, helpful to reduce patients' need for another procedure um, to treat their heart disease and, and, and actually leads to no increased um, issue of uh, heart attacks and death rate, and I'll show that to you in a second. However, as you hear from the news, over time, there's some, another signal that came up, which is a little bit unexpected, but in retrospect, maybe not so unexpected. So again, these two stents, now looking at a different event, not the target lesion revascularization, but look at an event called stent thrombosis. Soon after, maybe a couple years after this um, stent, these stents have been released, people have reported that somehow these patients sometimes suddenly close their stent. Like the heart attack um, scenario I described to you that occurred naturally, is that these stents are doing fine, and one day suddenly the stent will clot and close off. And compared to bare metal stents, which is very uncommon to have any problems occur after the first year. With the bare metal stent, it usually comes back with narrowing, with scar tissue, gradually over the first six to nine months. But after a year, they either have the scar tissue or they don't. And then usually they are kind of have no other events related to that spot or that lesion. But with these two stents, people start to re report back, there's few of these patients seem to have this sudden closing and they call it stent thrombosis because when some of the patients unfortunately died or had a big heart attack, they would examine the uh, sample and it looks like there's a clot sitting in the stent. So this is called stent thrombosis. So if you look at these two graphs again, 
In red on the left is the cipher stand, the drug stand. So clearly, it, goes, it seems like it goes down a little bit. These are the, well, how many times these patients have to stand thrombosis. So after one year, there were nobody in the bare metal stand have the stand thrombosis problem, but there was five patients have this stand thrombosis problem in the drug stand out of 878 patients. So the incidence is still very low, but there's a signal that was not there before. And do we know that this will happen? Obviously not, because you know, we, because we know in the past that these stents doesn't seem to have a problem over time. But as you know, any new technology, you always have some surprise thing that might come up. But the good news is that the numbers are still very small. The drug stents of Texas have two versus nine. So what are the incidents? We're talking about percentages maybe better for you to kind of absorb it. So the difference between the two arms, the bare metal side and the drug side, as a difference of about 0.6% over uh, four years. So it translates to be about 0.2% per year of having this stent thrombosis issue, two in a thousand. So if I tell my patients, what is the chance of having this problem? So it's about two in a thousand per year that this may occur, which is relatively small uh, compared to many other events that we talked about. And how about another background noise is that if you have a heart disease, what is the chances that you have a heart attack? Naturally, not having to do with, uh, even with best medication, it's about 1% per year. So this is 0.2% per year. So still the numbers is there. We don't want to get rid of, we don't we want to get rid of it, but it's not a large number. So again, there's a lot of tension, as you know, focused on these numbers and something obviously we want to work on, but it's not a number that's so alarming that you would pull the stents, you know, people, patients come back and say, can I have my drug stand removed? Um, certainly cannot be removed, but at the same time, it's really quite safe to leaving these stents in. The other part we don't know for sure is that are these patients actually, does this continue after four years? Does it just kind of plateau and stop? And obviously we don't know yet until we have further follow-up. Then the other issue, as, you know, as scientists, as medical uh, doctors as well, you ask the question, why is it occurring? Why, what is this thing? Why is it suddenly clot forms on these stents? It seems like the best explanation is that it goes back to the same reason why these stents work, is that they it inhibit scar tissue formation. So what happened is that the scar tissue took a longer time to heal over these stents. So you need some scar tissue, just like anything else. You don't want to have an open wound all the time. You want to have a little bit of scar to cover it. So the question is how to fine tune that little scar. In some patients, they don't seem to form the scar tissue much at all, six months, nine months. Most patients seem to have formed a, a scar tissue over the stent over a year. In the old days, the bare metal stent forms a scar in two weeks because you have too much of it. So the same mechanism that these stents are good for stopping the scar tissue, maybe also on the other end is the double-edged sword, maybe in some patients, in small number of patients, it slowed the process down enough that there is a certain amount of, of the stents not healing for a period of time that may take longer for the body to heal over it. This is just showing that in some of the samples that if you look inside, a fair number of patients at six, six months still have some not covered uh, stent struts. These are metal that are exposed to blood and not covered by scar tissue yet. So what do we know about the stent thrombosis? Are there risk factors? Meaning if you are doing certain things, we know that if you have diabetes, you are at higher risk for having heart disease. Mm -hmm. Do we know what are the risk factors for having stent thrombosis? The major one, instead of having that 0.6% or, or 1%, is really if you stop your um, aspirin and Plavix, which are the two drugs that we give to patients after stenting, which are drugs to stop the blood platelets from sticking to each other so that blood doesn't clot easily, is that you, the doctor tells you to take it for six months or three months at that time. You, for some reason, forgot to take them or for some reason is that it's not, not important. You have a 29%, almost close to 30% chance of clotting that stent early. Now, this is not talking about later on. This is the prescribed time interval that you, some reason, the patient forgot to you know, get the prescription, stop it. So that's why it's very important when we put these stents in, the patient adhere to what the doctor tells them. And even if the dentist tell them to stop it because they wanted to clean their teeth, it's not possible because we have to give this drug that period of time to allow the body to heal. And I'll talk, come over this, talk about this a little bit more uh, later on. Part of this is created this firestorm. Um, you know, obviously that uh, you know, um, the press makes it as if this DES uh, stent is, is killing patients. 
and it makes it also difficult for us now to sort of think about what exactly do we use in a lab. Do we use a bare metal stand or we use a drug stand? Because each has its advantages, right? The drug stands that really prevent scar tissue formation, makes you not come back to see the doctor as much as possible in terms of having another procedure. The bare metal stands, if you have no scar tissue after one year, the bare metal stand is the best stand because it doesn't clot. But you cannot beforehand know which patient clots or, or forms scar tissue. So that's, you can see our dilemma in the cath lab a little bit. But overall, we felt that the drug stent is still a very good uh, improved technology compared to the bed metal stents. So this is just to show you some statistics. In the, in the beginning, we were using 93% of the time. When we would say we is in the US, um, of the time using the DES, it went down to 81%, and now it's down to be about 70% to 30%. Maybe we were overusing drug stents a little bit, and you know, now it's come back to more kind of a worldwide number, about 70 to 80%. One important question that we have to ask ourselves, if we're causing all these stent thrombosis, you know, upward of 0.6% or so, are we hurting our patients? Because that's important, because if patients are dying more from the stent thrombosis and not getting much benefit from it, because you know, people will say, well, you know, I'd rather have a restenosis. Maybe I'll have surgery, maybe I'll have another procedure, but I want to live, I don't want to die from this. So the important observation is to make sure that indeed um, there's no difference in, in mortality rate. So again, these are two of the two stents showing you out to four years, um, all the data, and we flipped the two stents, but it doesn't matter too much, to show you that the two drug stents that we have now uh, on the market both shows you that there's really no increased risk of death, which is important because we are not obviously hurting patients, even though we're preventing some procedures, but we're not hurting them from, um, the, uh, from dying from the uh, uh, stents. This is looking at a little bit more broader ways, looking at MIs, heart attacks, and death, and again, showing that there's a very little difference between the stents and the, uh, the drug stents and the bare metal stent up to four years. You may ask, you know, if a sort of a more detailed question, if you, is the question is that, okay, you know, on one hand, or with the drug stent, you prevent renarrowing, so therefore you don't have procedures. On the other hand, you have the downside of causing some of these stent thrombosis that, as I told you, when you have stent thrombosis, it's a bad thing because you, a lot of times you will have a heart attack and you may have, uh, you, may, you may die from it. On the bare metal hand side, you have a fair number of people coming back for reoperation but you don't have the tail of a long of stent thrombosis. So this slide explains some of that uh, uh, nuances, and it's, I think it's, if you can pay it, you know, sort of go through this with me, it helps you understand it's really a balance. There's no free lunch in the world completely, and this is really looking at the side that got the bare metal side uh, stents, which is called control, and the people who got the drug stent, which is the Texas in this particular example, about 1,700 patients. So what happened is that if you look at the, what happened to these patients on the bare metal side, 14 patients have stent thrombosis, which is, uh, happens in bare metal stents as well, usually early on, a little less uh, later on. Fair number of them, 290 of them, have to come back for a second procedure because they have uh, 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 symptoms of the angina again. On the drug side, much fewer patients come back, half or less, 135 patients come back for another procedure. But stent thrombosis is a little higher. Remember, we have 20 patients now versus 14. But what happened is that when you have a renarrowing of the artery and come back for procedures, another procedure also has risk. You may have surgery, you may have to have another procedure, and that drives usually a heart attack rate of about 10%. And you can also die from your second procedure. So here, the 290 patients end up with about 11 patients have a death and MI. And then on the, because you have cut the number of patients coming back by a lot on the drug side, there's only four patients that had a complication from that. So when you add everything together, the two are very equal and matched. So that's kind of what you're paying for on the, on the drug side, is that you will have freedom from having another procedure, but you have a tiny risk going forward that if, uh, if you stop your medicine, for example, you might have a small chance of having a heart attack, 0.2% a year. If you have a bare metal stent, you would have a higher chance of keep coming back and more symptoms. But if you pass through that stage alive and no heart attack, then you have a better long run. So it's kind of a different uh, uh, mechanisms. But again, I think the doctors can choose probably which stent may fit your situation the best and maximize the, uh, the importance. 
just to give you an, a little perspective as well, is that you know, we have been doing this type of procedure since 1970s, first with a balloon, it's called a, what we call POBA, plain old balloon angioplasty. We create these terms that are kind of interesting. And then in the 1990s, we used stents. And then later on, we used DES in 2003 um, to present. If you look at um, the um, a couple lines, the first line is on the, um, the top, is, is the failure in red. You can see the rate, failure rate has fallen a lot. In the beginning, a lot of times it doesn't work. We were still doing them, but it was not work. So from failure of 30% down to the failure rate probably in the order of a percent. We also send patients to emergency surgery quite often in the beginning, up to less than 10%. The surgeon always have to stand by when we do the angioplasty. We have to call the, on the OR and say, look, can you have a room ready? We're ready to do this procedure. If it doesn't work, we'll rush it, the patient to you for bypass surgery. That happens in the, in the 70s and the 80s, and the chances are 5 8%. Now, as we can remember last time we sent a patient emergently for surgery. Emergency surgery is always no good because, not good, not as good, because it's, everything is rushed, and then you know, you're obviously at that time not very well. So now the emergency bypass rate is down to less than 1%. So in yellow again. So, and stent thrombosis, even in the beginning, when we have um, the stents, bare metal stents, it, it occur pretty often. We have to give patients a lot of bl uh, blood thinners to stop that, but now it's down to the rate that we talked about. So really we have made a lot of progress, and there's really, no, there's obviously no procedures completely free from uh, uh, risk, and it is important to put that in perspective. It's also important that uh, we collect data very accurately. This is data that is the FDA has mandated for all the manufacturers and measure the um, uh, risk of counting everything. And really, when you count everything, there's really not a whole lot of difference between the drug stand here, the cerulimus eluding in yellow, and in green, the bare metal stands over uh, four years almost. So again, I think we all felt very comfortable that there is really not a whole lot of increased risk of um, death and MI in patients getting treated with this stents. This is the Texas data, again, showing on the, uh, the death rate in the top left column, uh, MI rates, and so forth. So a couple of things. The FDA met in December last year to, because of this issue, and a couple of recommendations is important, is that they certainly feel that the approved stents are safe. There's a small increase in the stent thrombosis after one year, so you have to be careful and watch that. And, and this risk is not seen in BMS, or very uh, seldom seen in bare metal stents. And overall, because of the balance that we talked about, um, the drug stents is not uh, more dangerous, if you may, compared to the bare metal stents. Again, the concerns about the, uh, the thrombosis uh, certainly is a concern, but it doesn't outweigh some of the benefits we have seen in, in the drug stents. Off-label use, multiple stents and multiple lo locations, very long ones, is somewhat higher in risk, but as, as uh, you know, is obvious, to, I'm sure, to, to all, all of you, is that when you have lots of disease, it's going to be more dangerous, to, difficult to treat, just like if you have one single blockage. So that risk is increased, and we have to be careful on using drug stents for those. So in terms of what we have now come up with is really mainly treating patients after stenting with aspirin and Plavix, which is a like super aspirin, if you may, for one year because we felt that most of the time the stand would have healed up by one year um, in even a small number of patients. You pay for it by having some more bruising because Plavix will make you bruise more. And the other issue also is surgery. If you have some elective surgery needed to be done within that first year, it may have to be delayed. So one important question we asked our patient before we did this procedure is that do you have any planned procedures that is important for you to get done before we put this drug stand in. And if some of them are just you know, routine, I need to you know, implant a new tooth, you could wait. Or you need, I need to have colonoscopy done to screen something first. Maybe get that done first if your heart disease is not very serious. So really a, a good discussion with your cardiologist to see what kind of procedure you need to get done so that you're not going to planning to have any elective procedure for one year after your stent uh, placement. So again, that's an important issue to talk about. Also, it could be economical as well because the Plavix is not cheap and your insurance may pay for it. And if you don't have insurance, it certainly costs a couple dollars a pill a day, which is ridiculous. But that's uh, really the current price. So it's important uh, issues to go through. So again, a pending elective surgeries of any kind. And again, if you need new surgeries because you have a lot of things going on um, that is, may require surgery every six months anyway, then you may not be a good candidate for DES. Maybe a bare metal stent will be the good balance because then you could have take Plavix 
in a bad metal sense only for two weeks to a month, and you're done with the plavix, and you can have multiple surgeries. So again, balancing between that uh, to, to what's, uh, what your condition is. Again, it's important because a lot of dentists will just call you up and say, okay, stop the plavix, and you can come see me. Uh, you know, we get your teeth cleaned or pulled and whatever. And the patient, some of them just go ahead and stop it within a few weeks after their stent placement. So it's important to that we educate our patients and tell them to call our office. If there's anything that they, anybody, anybody tell you to stop their plavix, you need to talk to us. The question we ask our patient together with you is, is the patient a good candidate for drug eluding stents? And many of our, of our patients are, and some are not. And uh, if you're not, your risk of the DES outweigh the other uh, issues that you have. Again, there's some anatomical consideration we have that you know, is the doctor to decide in terms of where your blockage is, whether it is uh, you have to balance the risk of renarrowing and, the, and, and what is the consequence if the, if the stent suddenly closed, and how big the vessels is, how important, and various things. So that's kind of where we stand today, but obviously we're still working on in various methods to preserve the efficacy of the DES, meaning to reduce the re, um, Reprocedure rate, the, the TLR we talked about. At the same time, make the stents more compatible, meaning get rid of this um, delay healing. Part of it is maybe the polymer, the drug, the, the plastic that we put on the stent that some people may be allergic to. And some people may be rejecting that plastic because you know, most of us don't have plastic inside us, inside the bloodstream. So there are new technologies making these plastic much more compatible, like the membrane of a red cell. So, for example, one technology is using phosphatidylcholine, which is a particular chemical that is really very similar to the outer membrane of your red blood cell. So if you put that as a plastic, it may make uh, the body heal over that much easier and uh, enhance what we call endothelialization, meaning the cell actually grow over it, cover it, and make it part of the body very quickly. So that's on the way, and actually the FDA has a meeting to look at this particular stent in the next um, month in October and decide whether they will approve it for use uh, in the United States. It's been available actually outside of the United States for a couple of years already. The same stent also has a, uh, the, the, the polymer itself actually disappear over time. So over 30 days after the drug is gone, the polymer is gone as well. So the plastic is also, a very tiny amount of plastic will also disappear. So return the stand back to a bare metal stand-like uh, situation. So again, improvement potentially that might mitigate against this uh, stand thrombosis. And so far, in out of US studies, there seems to be no stand thrombosis after one year in this particular stand. So again, an improvement that may come in our way. The only issue with this one is that you pay for a little price too, but this stand doesn't seem to reduce the scar tissue as much. So you might have a tiny increase in your re-intervention rate. So again, everything has, you pull your sleeve this way and your sleeve the other side goes up a little bit. So it's really a balance of what exactly you need for your situation. Things our people working on as well is that why do we need a stent leaving there at all? Is to completely put a stent in the first for, for a while and then over a period of time, like maybe six months, a year, or two years, the stent, stent actually disappeared. So this is a completely biodegradable stent. And this has been actually made and tested in, in human in New Zealand and in Australia. This is made by Abbott Vascular or used to be Guidant. And it sounds very good. At the same time, though, it doesn't seem to reduce the scar tissue as much. And the, 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 the platform, the scaffolding, is a little weaker because plastic is not as strong as stainless steel. So everything is, is a difficult situation because that's why it took 15 years to really find a solution that actually worked. That is the multiple components of why the artery re-narrowed. And therefore, by treating one, you may expose the other. The balance that we have now, the current generation of DES, is actually very acceptable. We can improve on it on the stent thrombosis side, but if the patient actually is very compliant, listen to taking the drugs, we, lock on wood, have not had any really stent thrombosis here or the patients that we treated ourselves. So again, I think it's an important issue that uh, we have to have um, um, your buy-in as well. So I'm going to stop for a minute, and I'm going to have um, questions maybe later. So I, I want Bill to talk about uh, when do we actually can decide, because there's a, a, besides using what technology to treat, it's also important to say, look, do I really need it? Because medicine do a good job. I'm not having too much symptoms. Why are you talking that I need a stent? I want to just treat it naturally, whatever that means. So he's going to address that issue for us uh, quickly, and then I'm going to have uh, my patient kind of uh, we show a little bit of his uh, pictures and then uh, ask him some questions. 
Thank you, Alan. Uh, again, my name is Bill Furon. I'm an interventional cardiologist here at Stanford, and we'd like to welcome you and thank you uh, for taking time out of your Saturday morning. What I'll try to do in the next uh, 20 minutes or so is um, outline briefly, as Alan mentioned, uh, how we decide uh, to stent a patient uh, in which patients we think it's most appropriate. I uh, don't have any uh, conflicts of interest associated with this talk. Just as a, a little background, uh, coronary disease is the most common cause of mortality in the United States, uh, accounting for over 800,000 deaths per year. Seven million adults in the U.S. have symptomatic coronary disease, and the annual cost to the healthcare system uh, exceeds $75 billion. So it's a very important problem, as I'm uh, sure you're aware. This is to uh, remind you or uh, let you know if you're not aware of what we're talking about, these are the coronary arteries and there are two main ones, a left coronary and a right coronary. And the left one divides into two branches, the left circumflex and the left anterior descending and then the right coronary. And so we generally talk of people having three coronary arteries. The main manifestation of coronary disease or a narrowing in one of your coronary arteries is what we call angina or chest pain that occurs typically with exertion or when the heart's under stress. Uh, this picture um, is a classic example of the types of stresses uh, that the heart faces that can cause angina or this chest pain to occur. This is a, a gentleman who's just had a, a big meal at a restaurant and uh, after eating, the heart is under extra demand in order to supply blood to the gut to digest the food. So that's one stress. He's also carrying a, a br heavy briefcase and walking upstairs, exerting himself. When you exercise, the body needs more blood and the heart's under more stress. And typically, the heart can accommodate uh, very significant narrowings at rest so that people don't have any symptoms. But when they stress the heart, um, the narrowing becomes significant. The heart's not able to get enough blood flow and they begin to develop uh, angina. The uh, traditional method that we use to diagnose coronary disease is called the exercise treadmill test. And that's where we have a patient walk on a treadmill and we monitor the patient's heart rate and blood pressure and symptoms, as well as the electrocardiogram or EKG, which is shown down here. And the electrical activity of the heart changes uh, when the heart's not getting enough blood flow. And we can pick this up on the EKG and by inference diagnose a problem in one of the arteries uh, to the heart. What we've learned is that the accuracy of the exercise treadmill test alone is not as good as we'd like. And so uh, more advanced technology has been developed to uh, improve our ability to diagnose and locate uh, the problem uh, with respect to decreased blood flow. One of those methods is what's called a nuclear perfusion scan or thallium scan, which um, some of you may have had. And this is a test uh, also usually involves exercise, uh, but then uh, a thallium or a radionuclide uh, is injected, uh, a material that is radioactive, it's safe, but radioactive and can be detected by this, the scanner. And it's uh, injected at rest, and we see that this donut or cross section of the heart looks symmetric, there's orange throughout, so this material is getting to the entire heart during rest. But then when the patient stresses, you see that that um, area from about 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock, if you call this a clock, is not getting enough blood flow or orange. And that's the area supplied uh, by an artery that has a narrowing. So this is another way that we have for um, diagnosing coronary disease. When we have uh, a high suspicion, either based on the history or one of these uh, stress tests, we will often perform a coronary angiogram, which is done in the cardiac catheterization lab, uh, or cath lab. And this is a picture of uh, our cath lab here, uh, or one of the rooms in our cath labs. And a patient will lie on this table, and there's an x-ray machine, and we'll inject uh, dye or contrast material into the arteries uh, of the heart and take pictures. We uh, get to the heart by putting uh, a needle in the, after numbing up the patient and giving them some medicine to feel relaxed, uh, into the artery in the groin area. And then through that needle, we're able to thread a small tube or catheter. And through that tube or catheter, we can run an even uh, smaller and longer one up to the heart using the X-ray to guide us by going up the aorta. Uh, and then we are able to manipulate that tube or catheter into either the right coronary or left coronary artery. And then we can inject the contrast material or dye and take pictures, as you see on the right, and that's called an angiogram. 
And this has been our gold standard uh, method for diagnosing coronary disease or narrowings in the arteries. If we do find a narrowing that we think is significant and responsible for the patient's symptoms, we will often do an angioplasty, which is using a balloon to open up that narrowing and place a stent, as you've heard uh, in detail from Alan. And what you can see on the left is a very tight narrowing in that yellow circle, and then on the right, after the patient's had a successful uh, stent placed. Sometimes, uh, if patients have multiple narrowings and multiple vessels where they would require five, six, or seven stents, uh, we feel the benefit of stenting is less than the benefit of bypass uh, surgery, which you've uh, heard a little bit about uh, from Alan, where we uh, connect either an artery or a vein to the diseased uh, coronary artery beyond the blockage so that the, that part of the heart can now get adequate flow. And we'll uh, often recommend this in people who have multiple narrowings, or uh, we'll consider it in people who have a narrowing of the left main branch of their left coronary. That's the trunk that divides into the circumflex and the LAD. And because that's such an important branch, uh, if something were to go wrong with the stent, it could be devastating. And so in many cases, we'll recommend surgery for that. Now, there are some conditions uh, where we feel very confident that stenting is the best uh, therapy we have, uh, better uh, certainly than medical therapy. And one of those is uh, the condition of acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack. When someone comes to the emergency room with chest pain that's just come on and they have an electrocardiogram that shows or is consistent with a completely blocked artery, that's when we diagnose the acute myocardial infarction. We treat that as an emergency and bring the patient uh, immediately to the cath lab in order to open up that artery and place the stent. And we do that because of a number of studies that compared that approach to a, an approach of using medicine, a medicine called lytics, uh, which lice or break up the clot. And um, that medicine can be delivered through an IV, and so it's a less invasive approach. But these studies show that it's not as effective. Um, what you can see, the black bars represent patients who are randomized to the lytic therapy or medicine, and the open or white bars are those who went to the cath lab for uh, angioplasty and stenting. And the rate of death uh, at one year was significantly lower uh, the rate of a, a repeat heart attack uh, was significantly less, and the rate of repeat uh, chest pain, or what we call ischemia, where the heart's not getting enough blood flow, was also significantly less. So in the, in the setting of an acute myocardial infarction, we feel that we have very good data to support uh, placing stents. Uh, another area are patients who are also uh, what we call unstable, people who develop new onset chest pain that requires them to come to the emergency room, or people who might have had stable angina or chest pain, but it changes suddenly and it becomes much more frequent or more severe or longer lasting. And that kind of syndrome, when a patient comes into the emergency room um, and they have an EKG that doesn't suggest a complete blockage, but it might suggest a significant narrowing, uh, that is termed unstable angina. Uh, and these people we also uh, believe in most cases benefit from an aggressive uh, pro approach where we use stenting. This cartoon um, shows uh, sort of a seesaw with a number of studies uh, on the uh, right-hand side of the cartoon that were done that support this approach of bringing a patient for a stent, whereas there are a few that had a neutral result that didn't really show uh, benefit of either approach. And then there was one study that suggested medical therapy initially is the way to go. Um, however, when you look at the largest of the studies and you pool all of the results together, you find that the relative risk of dying is significantly lower if you uh, are treated invasively or aggressively with a stent when you come in with this type of what we call unstable angina. Again, this is another area um, where we feel fairly confident about our data uh, about the, the role of stenting. Now, Many of you may have seen uh, this headline either in the New York Times or one of the local papers this past uh, spring about how drugs are as good as stents. And um, this was based on a, a large study that uh, was performed in stable patients, um, not the unstable type that I'm talking about. And there is uh, some controversy over 
what the best strategy is for treating stable patients, people who have a very predictable angina or chest pain. It only comes on when they you know, walk up that hill uh, and get to a certain point, and then if they sit down and rest, it goes away. Um, but otherwise, they're doing fine. And so I would like to just take a minute or two to go through the COURAGE trial to try to explain uh, how we use it uh, in our practice um, to uh, decide which patients should get stenting. So first of all, this was a, a randomized uh, study comparing two strategies. One, very aggressive medical therapy. It was actually quite impressive how effective the physicians and the investigators were at um, getting their patients to take their medicines. The rate of patients taking aspirin and beta blockers and cholesterol-lowering medicines was superb, um, and that should be taken into account. So if, if you have a patient who can be very compliant and take their medicines very well, um, they have a, a better outcome. So they compared that strategy in patients who had stable chest pain uh, to a strategy of placing a stent uh, in the, uh, one or more narrowings that was seen on the angiogram. And they enrolled uh, just over 2,000 patients. And at four and a half years uh, average follow-up, there was no significant difference in the chance of a patient dying or having a heart attack or having a stroke between those um, two groups. So uh, in general, this study suggested that if you have stable symptoms and you have a narrowing on your angiogram, uh, in taking the population that was studied here, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, they can be treated uh, effectively with medicines and have a similar outcome with respect to uh, dying or having a heart attack. Uh, one thing that wasn't really uh, emphasized as much in the um, lay press regarding the study was the benefit that people who did get randomized to stenting had with respect to their symptoms. They had significantly uh, improved um, symptom relief if they received a stent both at one and three years so that they required less medicines. They were able to exercise without uh, angina uh, as commonly as the group who just were treated with medicine. So that is one um, benefit of the stenting arm. Now there were some limitations to this study as there are with any study. Um, one limitation is that they screened over 35,000 patients in order to enroll the 2,200 or so patients, meaning this was a fairly select population. They had to look at a large group of people with stable coronary disease in order to find people that fit the inclusion criteria. And some of the reasons uh, why that was the case is that they excluded what I would term high-risk stable patients. So people who have stable symptoms you know, like I said, very predictable angina, but when they go on a stress test, it's markedly abnormal. Those people, they weren't enrolled. They were treated outside of the study. Or people who had an anatomy, coronary anatomy, that was felt to be unfavorable, like if the left main branch that I was talking about was narrowed, those two were not included. Um, so again, when looking at this study and when we look at our patients, we have to remember uh, these aspects of the study and, and decide whether or not our patient actually fits uh, the criteria uh, that were included in the study. And one other point that also wasn't stressed much and I think still needs to be proven but um, I feel fairly strongly about is that the decision uh, in this study about which narrowings to stent was based on the angiogram, the pictures that they took, as well as information from the stress test results. And what we've learned um, is that both of these can be misleading. Um, this is the standard way um, that most uh, interventional cardiologists decide how, you know, whether to stent or not. But there are other techniques, adjunctive technology, that we have available to us that we use here commonly to help guide us to decide for sure whether or not a narrowing needs to be stented. Because we have found that the angiogram can be misleading. You can have what looks like a tight narrowing, but actually it really isn't that tight when you investigate it further. Or you can have a very mild narrowing that may end up being responsible for symptoms. And the stress test certainly can be misleading too. And so uh, what we have found is we need uh, better ways beyond angiography alone to look into the artery and try to find out uh, more information about particular narrowings. And one of those you heard briefly about intravascular ultrasound, or IVIS, is a technique um, developed about 15 years ago uh, extensively by uh, people here like Paul Yock and Peter Fitzgerald and Alan Young. Um, and it entails uh, using a catheter that has an ultrasound probe near its tip 
that emit sound waves um, that are then reflected back and received by the catheter and displayed on a screen. And we can get cross-sectional images of the vessel as shown in the right um, box there. And these uh, images give us very detailed information about what's actually going on inside the artery. The angiogram is more of a, uh, what we might call a luminogram, where we see the lumen or the hole, but we don't really see the wall and we can't tell how much plaque there is. The IVIS tells us exactly how much plaque or atherosclerosis buildup there is and how much it's encroaching on the lumen. And uh, using IVIS, we found that many people have much more plaque than we appreciate based on the angiogram. And it can definitely help guide us as to where the most severe part of the narrowing is and which areas need to be treated. It's also quite useful when we deploy our stents. And we're learning that the risks of the stents can be decreased uh, if we are able to deploy them more effectively. So things like stent thrombosis and restenosis can be improved um, if we're able to make sure that the stent is adequately deployed. And we can use IVIS uh, as one technology to help us make sure the stent's completely expanded, that it's touching the wall everywhere, and that there aren't any tears or dissections uh, at its edges. Another uh, technology that's still experimental that we're investigating in our animal lab and uh, is not yet widely ap applicable to um, patients in the cath lab is something called OCT, or optical coherence tomography. And this is analogous to IVIS, except um, it's a wire instead of a catheter. And instead of emitting sound waves, this wire emits light waves that are reflected back and um, displayed. And this, because it uses light instead of sound, it has much finer resolution and it can really see very detailed um, aspects of the vessel wall and the plaque or atherosclerosis. And it can show us exactly what type of um, material uh, is, is making up that plaque, whether it's a lot of cholesterol or whether it's more scar and fibrotic. And we can use this information to help us decide whether or not this narrowing is uh, likely to go on and cause a heart attack. This is still very investigational, but it's some exciting uh, technology that we hope to be uh, applying to uh, care of our patients in the, in the future. Um, and then the last uh, adjunctive technology, which is uh, dearest to my heart because it's my focus of research, is a, a wire um, called a coronary pressure wire. And it has, uh, it's a, mini a, a tiny wire that has a miniaturized pressure sensor near its tip. And it allows us to measure the pressure of the blood flow and in that manner get more information about what uh, significance a narrowing is having on blood flow. We can place that wire beyond a narrowing like you see in the left hand uh, cartoon and we can measure the distal pressure or PD, that's the pressure down at the end of the artery and we compare it to the measure pressure, the pressure measured with our catheter that's in the opening of the artery called uh, PP or the proximal pressure. And um, in a normal vessel, the pressure should be the same throughout the artery. But when you get buildup of atherosclerosis or a plaque, that pressure beyond the narrowing goes down. And uh, when that ratio of the distal pressure to the proximal pressure uh, becomes, goes down enough uh, that we call that, arter, that narrowing significant. And you see in the right hand bottom cartoon, two pressure tracings and the, the lower one, uh, I'll try to get this arrow to work down uh, here, is the distal pressure. And you see how it's much lower than the red one, which is the proximal pressure. And when it gets less than 0.75, that ratio, we usually think that that's a significant narrowing and it requires a stent. And again, what we have found in using this device is that you can have a narrowing uh, in one patient that looks 50%, and this uh, FFR, or fractional flow reserve, which is the index that we measure, is 0.90, totally normal. And then in another patient, a very similar looking narrowing, yet the FFR is 0 0.60, uh, quite significant. And um, I think having this information can help us decide whether or not to stent. And I'd like to show you a case uh, that helps bring out um, how this can be useful. This is a 50-year-old man that presented here at Stanford who had high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Uh, otherwise, he was very healthy. And he was awakened by chest pain. And this was the third time it happened in the past week. And this time, it didn't go away. So he came to the emergency room. His electrocardiogram, or EKG, did not show any signs of a completely blocked artery. So we didn't think he was having um, 
uh, a heart attack that required emergent uh, treatment. However, he did, over the course of the night, uh, he was admitted to the hospital and given some medicine. He did develop slightly abnormal blood tests that suggested he had a small amount of damage to his heart. Probably not a completely blocked artery, but enough that we were concerned, and he was referred for a cardiac uh, catheterization procedure. And this is what it looks like when we do an angiogram. You'll see the catheter in the center of the screen, and we're injecting the contrast. That little um, reflux or smoke that you see is normal. That's just some of the contrast coming out of the coronary and going into the aorta. And then you see the coronary filling. And you'll see that right at the beginning of the artery, there is some area of narrowing. Uh, that we would call mild or moderate, maybe 40, 50 percent, but concerning enough that some people might consider going ahead and stenting that. When we look at the left coronary, this big artery coming down the middle is the left anterior descending, and here we see another narrowing that perhaps is a little more severe and a little more worrisome, um, and again, many people would just go right ahead and stent that. And uh, in this case, we used uh, that pressure wire, and we first measured this index uh, FFR in the right coronary, and we found that the pressure beyond that area of mild to moderate narrowing was very close to the pressure, pressure just before it, giving a ratio of 0.89. And so we did not place a stent there, and I think um, many people may have, and, and in other studies, perhaps like the CURD study, there may have been narrowings like that which were getting stented that not, did not necessarily need to. And then we look at the LAD, the artery to the front of the heart, and that narrowing, the FFR was quite significant, 0.59. So we went ahead and did stent that, and the patient's done quite well. Um, and again, I think this helps you uh, see how we can use these technologies beyond just the angiogram to help us decide how to stent. Um, this has been looked at in some studies. This was a study called the DEFER trial which looked at people with narrowings like the one I showed in the right coronary, 50, 60%, that um, the operator wasn't quite sure whether or not they needed to have a stent, and the FFR was measured. And in half the patients, a stent was placed even if the FFR was above 0.75, and in half the patient was treated medically if the um, FFR was above 0.75 or it was deferred. And you see that at five years, the chance of, of having a, a heart attack or of dying was um, half, basically, the chance of uh, that happening if you had a stent anyway. So it showed that it is safe to use this wire to decide not to stent um, if you're not sure. The um, opposite of this is shown here where um, this was a study uh, where the patients had FFR measured and they didn't get a stent no matter what. They were all treated medically. But if the FFR was less than 0.75, you see at one year their chance of having a major adverse event was significantly higher than the group who had a higher FFR. So this uh, provides data to support the idea that if the FFR is low, you should put in a stent. So um, we have some good information to help us decide uh, what to do. What we are finding more and more is our patients um, uh, come in is that more and more have advanced disease involving not just one artery but multiple arteries. And in that case, it can be even more challenging to decide uh, how many of these narrowings need stents. And uh, there was a retrospective study that wasn't randomized that was small also, just looking at 137 patients um, and comparing uh, in some of those patients, the operator decided to use the pressure wire to help uh, help make the decision about stenting. And in others, the operator just said, I'm going to go with the angiogram alone. And so it's a, not the greatest study because it wasn't uh, prospective or randomized. But in any case, the study did show that the group that uh, the pressure wire was used in had a better outcome. So to further look at this, we've now embarked on a, a large study, a multi-center international study involving uh, 13 uh, European and 7 U.S. sites. And the goal of this study is to compare an angiographic uh, guided strategy to stenting uh, using drug-eluting stents in people with multiple narrowings to an FFR guided strategy. And the way the study works um, is we're about uh, to complete it, actually. We've enrolled around 980 patients, about 100 uh, here and at the VA. And the, the patient has an angiogram, and if they have two or more narrowings that we think need a stent, and they agree to participate, then they, um, the operator says, okay, based on the angiogram, this is where I'd put my stents. 
Then they get randomized and uh, they either get their stents um, put in based on the angiogram or if they get randomized to the pressure wire, then the wire is used to obtain additional information and only if the wire also shows that it's significant do they then get stent. And then they're followed for one year and we're uh, looking at the major adverse events at one year. And so we're hopeful that um, this study and others like this will um, teach us that we can get more information using other techniques in the cath lab. And in particular, we need uh, information about the physiology. We also need information about the structure of the narrowings and the biology. And there are fortunately things like fractional flow reserve, intravascular ultrasound, and um, soon OCT that will provide us with this information. So uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So Mr. Hatch has been a patient of mine since 2003, and, and I think originally he had a, a, a slight heart attack, and, and an outside hospital, they could not open up one of his arteries, and he came down to see us. And this is what uh, we see, there's a, there's a stent, actually a drug stent at that time in 2003 um, that uh, we put in um, and actually has been looking well. And recently, another stress test shows that there's some issue of the blood flow maybe not getting enough in the front part. And you can see there's some narrowing there. And I, I did what exactly Bill uh, was suggesting, and we did an FFR, which turns out to be about 0 0.79, and then an, an ultrasound uh, that shows that the area is relatively narrow and decided to go ahead and um, treat it with a, a stent. And this is uh, the balloon that we sort of inflate in that area, and then um, we put another stent. You can see the stents pretty nicely in this view is that uh, these two markers is where the stand is mounted on the balloon. And then this is the final picture that uh, the, the area looks much better. So, so, so it, when, you, when we were talking, I mean, 2003, when we had the first stand, we actually didn't have the issue. It was relatively easy. And in 2007, sort of the same stand, but, but you know, the issue of uh, stand thrombosis, and, and I'm sure you have looked into that a little bit. Is that a concerning thing? And what we talked about today is just really uh, from a physician side, but from a patient side, do you think that's uh, it's helpful information? What do you think? Well, Dr. Young, I uh, uh, thought that it was important, uh, but it wasn't troubling to me because I viewed it uh, as an improvement. And um, uh, I based my decision uh, on my family history and, of course, what had happened to me. I think that my decision, uh, and this is of course from a lay point of view, uh, my decision to, to have this done uh, was based on a goal, and of course my goal uh, was to keep breathing. <laughs> and to me, uh, I, I thought that uh, that, that was, uh, uh, was uh, what I wanted to do. When we first did this uh, in, uh, in 2003, the FDA had just approved uh, the drug uh, eluding stent. I think uh, we did this in July. They had just approved it uh, in April. Uh, however, uh, and so I didn't know about the clotting. Uh, I didn't know uh, about um, uh, any of the reactions that, that might occur. Uh, when we did it in 2007, of course, I knew about uh, some of the uh, potential uh, uh, reactions, but I had no problem, uh, no reaction at all uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, the, the drug-eluting stent. I knew about the clotting, uh, but I uh, thought that we could take Plavix and, in fact, that's what I did do at that time. Uh, for the first one, we took Plavix for six months, and now uh, we're going to take the Plavix for a year uh, to try to correct uh, that clotting problem. Of course, on the other side uh, of the coin, uh, we could have not done the drug-eluting uh, stent, and uh, I would have had, uh, which I knew about, I would have had the problem with uh, restenosis and I have read uh, that with some patients, some 20 to 40 percent 
uh, of the patients have had restenosis. Now, the information that I read was back in, in 2003, and maybe uh, that has been uh, revised by now. And also, uh, uh, I could have done, uh, you know, some other more invasive procedure that would have taken uh, a lot longer to, uh, uh, for, for me to heal, and, uh, or I could have done nothing and uh, possibly had another heart attack, which could have been fatal. So that was what was going through my mind, and uh, uh, I viewed uh, what was done uh, as an improvement. And um, at Stanford, uh, where, of course, where I was referred, uh, they give you plenty of help to make the decision. Uh, Dr. Young, a pro here he is, a professor of medicine, uh, he's the chief uh, of uh, the division of, of cardiovascular medicine here at the hospital. He's the director of the cath lab. He calls me up uh, and talks to me about this. And um, uh, I had, uh, after I talked with him and, and assessed the, uh, the risks and possibilities, uh, I had uh, no, no problem at all. Um. Do, do you worry about the stent in you? Because, you know, there's, there's patients that basically thought, you know, how, how do I deal with this uncertainty, uh, if it clots, this small chance, and, and how do you kind of deal with that uh, uncertainty? I guess each, but everybody is deal with it differently, but how, how would you approach that? I, I, have, I, have, I have no problems with that. I just count, discount it because, uh, uh, you know, there, uh, there's uncertainty in everything that you do, and... Uh, uh, you sort of have to weigh the the risk, and and in my own mind, I weighed them, and uh, and uh, I have discounted uh, most of the problems that uh, that you've discussed. So chances today. are small. Yeah. Yes. Is it, was a plavix bothersome? Does it, a lot of people worry about you know bruisings or, or bleeding? And you have to be careful uh, shaving in the morning because you uh, uh, you'll bleed a lot more than than you want to, and if you want to go out somewhere. Uh, you've got some paper hanging on you to try to stop it. So. Uh, thank you very much, um, okay, Mr. Thank so you. you can step here for a minute and maybe um, now we can open up basically. You can ask questions to me, to uh, Bill, to Mr. Hatch, and any questions you have on what we talked about this morning. Question? So the current FDA recommendation for sort of on-label use, meaning that the lesions are relatively short and one stand is for one year, and you can stop after that, but continue the aspirin in, indefinitely. So in your situation, the only factor that I need to f figure out or find out is where is your stent, how long, how big, and what the result looks like. And if it looks like it's a relatively straightforward lesion treated at that time, I'll be comfortable for you to stop the plavix now. But if it is in a location that is very critical, sort of out of label use, meaning that it's more uh, a longer, smaller stent or in difficult location, it might uh, ask you to take plavix indefinitely. So it's really a, a little bit more detail about um, the location, the size, the, the procedure itself. Um, it's easy for me to, 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 to talk to my patients because you know, obviously, hopefully, I know what I did uh, and, and explain to them sort of individually. I have, ch I have certain patients stop after one year and I have certain patients continue. Uh, so so you're, in your situation, if it is 2005, two years already, uh, the chances are rel relatively small. Uh, most likely you can come off of it, but again, a little bit more detail uh, f uh, that is the doctor level detail and you can decide. Yeah. So after you have gone through aspirin, plavix for a year, and the plavix is stopped, we generally like our patients to take and one adult strength uh, aspirin, so 325. Uh, that's what we like to, our patients to do. Obviously, if there has a lot of bruising, a lot of intolerance from stomach, for example, then at least half a dose of that, which is two babies uh, uh, aspirin. So uh, again, we generally like to recommend a little higher dose aspirin uh, for one adult strength per day uh, after the first year. Um, you know, if you can, if just, uh, the stomach is doesn't bother you, you should probably take an adult strength 324, uh, uh, 325 uh, each day. My sense is that in balance, if you have three stents and um, you have to have at least one year, um, and because it's somewhat of a more off-label use because there's three of them, um, that I would uh, generally recommend you to take um, Plavix indefinitely unless there's an issue of uh, you know, a lot of bleeding or other things. But after one year, you probably can stop it for a few days to get some uh, colonoscopy done, uh, get some dental procedure done and start back again. 
So it's not like you cannot stop your plavix after uh, that time, but, but more electively you can stop it, hold it, but minimize the amount of time you are off plavix because you cannot like, indefinitely tell you not to have any elective you know, uh, uh, minor procedures and so forth. Um, the other possibility that we are you know, thinking, developing is getting other, possible, other tests that eventually may be able to tell us whether we can tell certain people are higher risk after one year. Uh, for example, um, we didn't talk about it too much, is that sometimes when, you, when it's poor healing, the artery can actually pull away from the stent and have what we call a little um, incomplete apposition. The stent actually not touching the wall anymore in a small pocket. If you have those, you might at a higher risk of uh, uh, thrombosis, the clotting. Uh, and you might be the person that you need to take indefinitely. But we don't have those clues uh, nailed down yet well enough to recommend it uh, across the board. So I would say in your situation, what you told me, I would, I would take it uh, indefinitely, uh, uh, continuously for one year, and then indefinitely uh, at that point, unless more data comes out, and also but be able to stop periodically for whatever you need to have it uh, procedure done. So uh, the question is, uh, is there uh, advances that can actually measure that uh, fractional flow reserve using non-invasive methods so you don't have to stick a wire uh, in the coronary artery? So, Bill, you want to take that? Um? That's an excellent question. We don't yet have that capability. We do have some advances that uh, I didn't touch on uh, in non-invasively looking at the coronary arteries that you may have heard about, something called uh, CT angiography or, or CAT scan angiography, which is getting better and better, and we're studying extensively here at Stanford as well, to um, hopefully in some patients be able to apply as a non-invasive way of doing an angiogram and avoid uh, the small risk of um, you know, having to uh, go through the artery. But um, as far as measuring the fractional flow reserve, we still don't have that ability. Generally, I, I usually only do an angiogram if there are symptoms, uh, or we generally do a surveillance stress test, meaning that every year or every 18 months or so, we do put you on a treadmill and we kind of see whether there's any ischemia, meaning that um, it's very it's nice and not nice to have angina because angina is good in the sense it serves you a signal that you have a blockage and get you to treatment. And also it's good because it serves you as a warning afterwards if it's not working. But there's about one third of the patients have a lot of blockages but no symptoms whatsoever. Um, because the system that inside the heart to warn you that it's not getting the blood flow is not a very developed uh, system like an external system of sensation of in your skin, for example. So there are a fair number of patients that doesn't have that. So we generally tailor that to a patient and decide whether they need to have a routine uh, stress test follow-up. So if that stress test has changed, that it is uh, was, uh, a certain level was good before, now has shown some evidence of potential ischemia, then we usually take people to an angi to angiogram lab and, and study them and see whether there's any change uh, or narrowing uh, of the arteries. The, the best stent there is, actually, is a bare metal stent that has not re-narrowed, as I said before. The reason is that that means that it's healed up perf well, and as the likelihood after a couple of years is it doesn't really re-narrow at that spot, um, unless your cholesterol is still high and you don't you know, take care of your, yourself. So, uh, in general, the choice of angiography after stenting is mainly based on symptoms and based on probably some non-invasive uh, stress testing that uh, Bill talked about. The, the question is, what is the basis if there's death in, right, right. The major benefit of most interventional procedure, angioplasty, stenting, whatever kind of stents you use, is relief of symptoms. That if you have angina, um, that will take care of it most of the time, get rid of the uh, uh, symptoms. Medicine do a pretty good job, but very rarely medicine completely relieve the angina. So that is a choice that you have to decide together with your physician. The second thing that the angioplasty or stenting is indicated for is that without symptoms, sometimes we still do them because the stress tests show large amount of the heart muscle not getting enough blood flow, and not getting enough oxygen and blood flow, and that's called ischemia. And that has been shown in some study it will give you a bad prognosis, even though when you have no symptoms. So only you really should do those two things to decide to have an angiogram based on those two things. And, and you might refine that further with the te with these various technology that Bill talked about in the calf lab to see whether you need to treat an individual lesion. So a choice of intervention or no intervention is really based on mostly to re reduce symptoms. Very rarely, um, at, least it, at least for now, we have not shown that an interventional procedure with stenting 
drug or bare metal that will actually improve uh, mort mortality in patients uh, uh, over four years, five years. So the question is, how has the Courage trial changed my practice? I haven't changed too much. I think, at least in, in my practice for the years, is that I generally, um, as I answered the previous question, take people to the lab because of symptoms and ischemia and explain to the patient, hopefully accurately, that it really is not a, a procedure that they need to prolong their life, a, lot, a procedure to prevent heart attack, because as I think a fair number of patients may have the impression that when they have an intervention or a procedure like angioplasty is that they would live longer they would have prevent a heart attack. And I generally tell them that to prevent heart attacks and make longer is really a medical therapy to change your risk factors, your cholesterol, which is always part of the, our, our treatment anyway, to prevent you from having uh, new blockages or progression of old blockages. And the intervention is really to supplement that to treat narrowings that produce symptoms. So we have been practicing pretty much what uh, Courage would expect us to do uh, in terms of uh, stable patients that really have uh, not a lot of ischemia, that we would really treat them according to how much symptoms they have. As, as Bill has outlined, fair number of patients in Courage trial that were randomized to medical therapy more than one third cross over to, to treatment with uh, intervention over time. Uh, so it's a matter of just stopping it for a while, which most of the time is also a fair thing. If the patient says, well, you know, I want to take medicine for a while and see how I feel, and I can do what I want to do with the medicines, a little bit of angina, it's all right. There's no, no problem with that. Um, it is effective for thinning your blood, and there's some benefit of Plavix in general for vascular patients, that they prevent some of the clotting, some of the, uh, uh, the platelets itself is also a factor that creates new blockage. So in general, if you take that aside, in some patients, Plavix is helpful to prevent uh, new events in the heart. If you stop it for three to six months already, then I don't see a whole lot of reason for drug stand standpoint to restart because the, the, the risk is really to uh, say, well, you know, it, you kind of prove yourself that you're not a person that probably clot in that situation. Um, and then, re so it, it, the, the question is, why did you stop in this first place? And then if, if it really just to come off, then I would, I would just stay off. I, I just didn't think it's helpful to sort of come back and forth. So, I mean, there's no pill to me that was worth $5 a day in terms of, uh, uh, um, you know, the cost. And the, the problem with Plavix is that is, uh, there's no comp competition. The competition is called Tyclid, which was, actually came out first, but it has to be take twice a day, taken twice a day. And also, it has a small chance of getting your blood, white blood cell count dropping very, very much. So you have to have blood tests every two weeks to monitor that. Um, and uh, maybe a little higher incidence of rash as well. So Plavix is an improvement over that, and that's why it, it did so well. The problem is that there was a con Canadian, com Canadian company who made generics for them, and they basically, the company who made it in the U.S. and sued them and shut them down and uh, buy them off uh, because it's so lucrative. Why would you not pay some money and shut that, that other guy off? Um, there will be a couple of companies making new competitive products out, and hopefully the price will drop at that time. Uh, and that's a big issue. It's really the price is unreasonably high because they are, might have a monopoly uh, of this uh, of this area. Right. Yes. Right. Right. So yeah, it's, unfortunately, that's how it works. It's thin your blood and make you. Uh, whenever you, you know, we we don't realize that you know I lean on this thing, I lean on that thing. It's actually the, the, the little blood vessels on the skin probably is a little bit damaged by just my pressure leaning on it. But most of the time, it repairs itself and there's no leakage of blood. But in 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 a person taking aspirin and plavix, that might be enough just for the red cells to come out. Thank you very much for all. If you have any questions, we'll be still here. Okay. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.